Welcome to the Life Science and Marketing Podcast, where we discuss marketing and career insights and tips with leading experts from across the globe. Let's join our host, Paul Avery, CEO of Biostrata, as he chats with our next Life Science Marketing guest. So today I am joined by Jalil Shujas. Jalil has deep life science marketing and commercial knowledge gained working over the last 20 years at organizations like GE Healthcare, ATCC, Cognizant, Absorption Systems, and more. He's also an ex-scientist with a degree in biology and lab experience working on high-throughput cell-based assays for Bayer Healthcare. It's an absolute pleasure to have him with us today. Welcome to the podcast, Jalil. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. It's uh, the, the pleasure is all ours. Um, just to get us started, perhaps you can bring your, not like my introduction that I steal from LinkedIn, bring your, uh, your story to life for the listeners. Yeah, so my, my mother always wanted me to go to medical school, as most parents do. And um, so when I went into college, I was pre-med and in order to get more experience, I started working in a lab at Tufts Medical School. And that's where my love of science began. And it's sort of one of those situations where you uh, come for lunch and stay for dinner, you know, <laughs> because I ended up being in that lab for eight years, uh, well past my graduation from Tufts. And, um, you know, one of the things that we used to see every morning when we came to work, there was a little um, little note above the balance, the weight balance, and it said something to the effect uh, of biomedical research is one of the most sustained joys a human being could ever endure. <laughs> <laughs> and it was by a, a famous essayist named Lewis Thomas. And, and having re read that every day, it really started to sink in that really what we're about in science and as people in general is discovery, right? whether it's discovering the world around us, discovering new things about ourselves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's where I really fell in love with science and stayed so long into science. After um, the academic lab, I went on to work at Yale and then subsequently Pfizer and Bayer and got into pharmaceutical drug discovery, where the palpable connection between what we were doing in the lab and human health were you know, was really evident. In fact, one of the drugs that I worked on ended up becoming a marketed drug for renal cell carcinoma. So it was a great pleasure to do that. Um, at one point, uh, an HR rep actually told me, uh, you're too clever for science. You need to be in marketing. I was like, oh man, that's a huge insult, right? Because scientists, I thought, always thought were pretty clever, apparently not as clever as marketers. So that's controversial. Um, I like that. That's co controversial item number one. I'm starting a tally list. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. There'll be more. Um, but anyway, so uh, I, I looked into the um, looked into marketing. Bayer had a management training program um, where they'd send you to get an MBA degree, and subsequently you could, you know, potentially work in their marketing group, et cetera, et cetera. But when that time came as I was finishing my degree, they said, oh, we're going through a global restructuring. We don't have any positions in our marketing group. So uh, this was actually, it's kind of foreshadowing about marketing in general, but because um, <laughs> one of the first things people cut is marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that a little later, I guess. Um, but so I, you know, I went out and they said, here's our, here's the degree with our compliments, go about and find your own way. And so one of the first place I worked was Salomix. Um, high throughput uh, cell biology company, which ultimately is uh, became part of Thermo Fisher, and then subsequently I wanted, went on to G Healthcare, working on their in cell platform, and thus began my journey into marketing. Love it. What about um? What about outside of work? What do you love outside of work? Outside of work, well, this is going to sound uh, strange, but I really enjoyed playing the ukulele. And uh, I was in a competitive karaoke uh, team here in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
but I'm not part of that anymore. Please explain to me what competitive karaoke is. I mean, does that end? Is it like uh, there's some wrestling involved or is it a sing off? Like, what? It's, yeah, what? Is it's, it's, yeah, I guess sing off would be the most appropriate term <laughs> to describe it. Uh, you know, you come with the costumes, you're acting out the song, and it's uh, the people in the audience vote which group or rendition they like the best. There's a, usually a theme. You know, it could be like Disney songs or it could be, um, you know, it could be anything really, but uh, there's different themes and you just have to bring it. I love it. That's why I love this podcast, Jill. I must have known you for the best part of 10 years, if not longer. And I did not know about that. And now I'm going to go crawling around the web, trying to find videos of that. There must be a video somewhere that I can find. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> there may very well be. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so that was fun. I, so I love music, I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, and I, I have a studio set up in my basement to make, uh, soundtracks. That is so cool. I love that. I love that. Thanks for saying that, Jalil. That's amazing. What about, um, cause you've done, you've done a fair bit in science. You're clearly very passionate about science. What's been the sort of most interesting product or research project that you've worked on and what, you know, what? made it stand out to you? Well, I guess, I mean, the, the one uh, that I was mentioning earlier, I was on the project team for Nexavar, which is a renal cell carcinoma drug that's being, was marketed. I think they've come out with newer versions since then. Actually, it was one of those strange things, you know, when, um, uh, when so many years have passed, right? This was almost 20 years ago. I was at AACR recently, this past April, in Orlando and I went to the Bayer booth and I saw the subsequent drugs and, and I told them the people at the booth that I was working on this drug, oh, they're like, oh my God, you're one of the people that worked on this. And, and, and it was like, you know, it was really heartwarming and a little validating, I guess. Um, I would say definitely because that one is demonstrated, right. To have a direct impact on human health. In fact, the paper that where we first described some of the characteristics of this drug is is still one of the most cited papers in modern cancer research. So that is so cool. What an awesome thing to be involved in, and certainly something you could be proud of for many yeah. many years. And I'm sure you have been. Um, well, I will say. Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> I will say one thing uh, too. Is that um, you know I'm also a father, right? And um, my daughter is 15 years old. And uh, she's also, you know, kind of buoyed by um, by the fact that her father and also her mother are working in cancer research. She's currently also doing cancer research at Georgetown uh, University. So, you know, she's 15, she's in the lab, and it's great to see the passion that we had for science being pushed on to the next generation and, can and specifically in cancer research as well. I love that. You're a science family. Amazing. Um, you've been meeting with your science extended family a lot this year, because I know you've been to lots of conferences. What have you been seeing on the science front or the technology front that's really made you go, oh, wow, that's cool? Oh, well, I mean, cell and gene therapy certainly has been around, you know, or been coming to the forefront in the past few years. Um, but really in the past two years, I see the emergence of uh, spatial transcriptomics, single cell um, RNA sequencing, single cell analysis, spatial analysis, like <laughs> various combinations of those words um, has really come uh, to the forefront of research technologies. Uh, I'm waiting to see how those, you know, play, what roles they play in actually helping to develop drugs and drug discovery, but the information that's coming out of those technologies is, is amazing. It's amazing. And I think overall, I mean, just the promise of genomics that was uh, given to us years ago is finally coming to fruition in a big way. And all of the things I talked about are directly related to that genomics revolution. So it's still going on, really. Tell us a bit more about that how the genomics is finally starting to pay dividends because it is a long time ago since we got the human genome 
completed and you're right it's felt like it's taken a while to get here so how's that manifesting for you um i mean for me personally i think i guess it uh it's really just seeing the companies that that are involved in in those i mean if you went uh to any of the conferences that i went to this year i saw so many companies in regardless of the um, therapeutic area right so immunology oncology neuroscience you see this explosion of these single cell companies i think initially what genomics did was to say what are the tangible differences between genomes meaning the genome of a human versus the genome of a orangutan versus the gene and we were looking at differences this way but i think now it's very evident that the genome is uh, somewhat variable even on an individual on a cellular level right because cells at the leading edge of a wound are going to be expressing different um, different genes than than those at the you know sort of behind the wound um, and you know it's just it's just really fascinating and really makes for things like CRISPR and other you know targeting mechanisms going to make it really, really useful to be able to determine. It, it blows my mind continually how complicated biology is. If we take the human body as an example of that and some of the complexities you just described, right, where we try and make generalizations about how different things work, like the genome or a cell or even a cell type. And of course, that just reduces it down to such a simplistic view of how it really works and all that complexity is lost and the truth is likely to be that that complexity is really important right otherwise it probably wouldn't be there um, in the yeah. first place so it's kind of baffling a little bit intimidating because it continues to remind me from my ex-science days of just how complicated it is and how it is a real mission for humanity to understand biology with the necessary level of complexity to really influence it in a way that we feel like we understand all the moving parts do you know what i mean oh absolutely I mean, let's and let's not forget the compounding complexity of epigenetics right so post-translational modification because even at a certain level um I, we're all different right we have the same you know high homology dna but we're all quite different and I think a lot of that complexity is somewhere hidden in their epigenetics. Yeah, I really, it's one of those areas I want to always learn more about and never feel like I get a true handle on, but it also feels like it evolves so quickly um, that, that that also makes it tough. Um, let's go back to the trade shows briefly. We've talked a little bit about science and technology trends. What other sort of trends did you pick up on your travels so far in 2023 in terms of perhaps where different aspects of the industry are moving or any other things you picked up? Yeah, this is, <laughs> this was really interesting, right? Because, you know, we we're coming off of the pandemic and uh, people hadn't been to conferences for years, uh, three, four years, I mean, about well, three years. And um, uh, people came back in a big way. Almost every conference that I went to, and I, I've been to nine or 10 this year, uh, was oversubscribed meaning they had a lot more attendees than even they expected. And so that was really interesting to, to see. Um, I don't think, I don't know that that will continue. I think it was just, uh, you know, people were anxious to get out <laughs> and meet each other again. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of hugs in, in these conferences uh, because they haven't seen each other for a while, but um, I don't think that's sustainable. Digital marketing was obviously a big thing during the pandemic. And I think it still has a role, um, but the problem is, like anything, uh, is staying, uh, staying differentiated, right? And it's like, how do you manage to stay differentiated in a world where everyone's doing the same thing? That's right? a great question. Perhaps you can help us answer that question, Jalil, on this podcast. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I this this may sound really crazy, but I was talking to you know, some people about this and, and, and what they are doing is actually sending out FedEx packages to people, right. you know, instead of doing, um, you know, digital marketing, blasting them with email and da, 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 
they, they were like, when was the last time you got a FedEx package? I'm like, uh, you know, other than Amazon, you know, it's probably not often. And see, they're like, that's our, that's the point is that first of all, you're going to open it. It's very directed. It's specific to you, right? You're going to open it and you're going to see what's inside it. Hopefully it's something memorable. And, you know, uh, you, you'll remember that because it's one of the few times you've ever gotten uh, a FedEx package from a company talking about something. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. It's crazy enough to work. And also they were saying, well, how much do you pay for, um, you know, pay per click, right? On Google ads or whatever. And yeah, it can vary, right? It can go from uh, nowadays, it's not pennies anymore like it used to be, but it's certainly like $10, can be $15 for certain keywords. And for FedEx, it's like eight or nine bucks. It's like you're actually saving money doing it the old fashioned way. And it's super targeted and you know, they're going to open it. Yeah. Right? I love that. When, when everyone else is zigging, you got to so zag. Exactly. So you got to yeah. figure out where the zag is. And we're just basically battling. It's all the attention economy. We're just basically battling for attention, really. And if you can find those tactics or channels that are underused, then you can then you can have a disproportionate impact, as you just described, right? Um, I hadn't realized that the cost of FedEx and sending something physical versus the escalating costs of Google ads, which I completely agree over the last two or three years, paid social, paid search, definitely has seen large increases in costs and it's harder to get the, the strong return on investment that you would have got five, 10 years ago. But yeah, the concept that it would be cheaper, that's quite interesting, right? Because I bet most people think, well, physical, sending something physical, that's expensive, isn't it? And it is, but so is Google ads now, especially for certain keywords. Yeah. And, and I mean... Uh, with the physical thing, it's a tangible thing. With the Google ad, it's, you know, did I actually serve that ad up? I, I don't even know. Yeah. But you know, you definitely sent it and they signed for it, right? So, right. <laughs> you know, they got it. Um, and I think, you know, especially, uh, you know, the thing might be some of these, oh, well, people are working from home, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, scientists are not working from home. Scientists had never worked from home during the pandemic. They were always in the lab. And so, uh, you know, that would have been a great time to send something to because they were getting all those messages, but nobody was getting mail, really. I don't know. I just, it's sometimes, you know, uh, it's not really just about zagging when everyone's zigging. It, sometimes it's just going backwards, right? You got to sometimes go a little bit back uh, because, I mean, honestly, I can't remember the last letter. I've got, I ever got, you know, what was the last letter? Some handwritten letter. Somebody sat down took the time and said, dear Paul, <laughs> you know, it was probably, you know, what? I, um, I got one the other day actually with a, uh, a handwritten letter with a, a dairy milk chocolate in it. Yeah. Um, and the letter referred to the dairy milk chocolate and, and was pretty clever. And I really appreciated the approach and it wasn't something that we needed. And I actually am allergic to dairy, so I couldn't even eat the chocolate. Um, but I really appreciated it because I do think finding ways to stand out, be memorable, um, is a critical part of marketing. And I think you can differentiate in your messaging, right? If you've really got a cool product that has real unique selling points that are unique, right? We can, in our product and service, we can do things that other people can't do or in a demonstrably better, faster, cheaper way. That's brilliant. In some markets where it's a bit muddier, and a bit harder to differ differentiate, how can you differentiate through your messaging or through your marketing approach, right? And this is a great example of that. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Yeah, I mean, it, we all, you know, like to believe that we're special and unique and unicorns, but sometimes we're not. And, uh, and that's one of the big challenges of marketing, right? Well, let's talk about the challenges of marketing because i do think life science marketing is its own it, it, a lot of the challenges of of normal and broader marketing are challenges in life science marketing but what do you think are the hardest things about life science marketing oh man that's a that's an interesting question I, that's a podcast in itself really but <laughs> uh, i mean i think one of the things that's very different and this may be true in other um kind of scientific based industries as well is the fact that the majority of the people who are doing the marketing 
are coming from science, right? Or in this case, coming from life sciences. And so um, they, what I found is a lot, many of them tend to forget their scientific background in the sense that they remember the topic, but they re forget the how, right? Meaning that there is an, there is a hypothesis, right? An experimental design, materials and methods, you know, results and conclusion, right? That's how we, the Cartesian method works, right? And when it comes to marketing, uh, sometimes people lose sight of that. So in other words, they were like excellent scientists, but as soon as they got into marketing, they're like, well, I think, you know, more red would be better. You know, <laughs> it's like, what, what are you talking about? You know, my, my boss, my first boss, when I was working in the lab at Tufts, he said to me, listen, Jaleel, you're going to get into a lot of arguments in your life. Be sure that you have the data to back you up because whoever has the best data wins. And that's all. And that's something that I've always remembered in, in marketing and in science and in life in general. And um, I think it's important that people um, collect data, the appropriate data, and really track how they're their marketing efforts move and, and have impact. I'm not saying that nobody does it, of course. Uh, I'm just saying that more people should think of it like, and, and be experimental as well. Right. Um, you know, it's not, it experiments don't, are not just one off. Sometimes they're one off experience just to show something small, but really an experiment is a continuum of experiments done by you and others throughout time. And that's how science keeps marching forward. And um, in order for us to be good marketers, we got to be able to take chances. And we also have to be continuous, you know, keep moving. Like, don't just do it once and expect amazing results. And when you don't see anything, just give up and go on to something else. That's not a strategy. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point because there's a couple of things that I think can make applying the scientific method to marketing more challenging. And I'd love to get your thoughts on how to overcome them. The first one is running experiments where you keep as many of the variables the same so that you can be sure that the one that you're testing is the one that has the impact, right? Because we're sending emails, but the context of our prospects has changed in the week between we did the first experiment and the second experiment. So did the message really influence it? Did, is it time of day that's important? And I, I think people try and run these experiments, but I think it's really hard because I think there's a loads of variables we don't know about and can't control for. So what are your thoughts about running tests where you control variables? Yeah, I mean, definitely, again, scientific method. But um, <laughs> what, there's some things that you, like you mentioned, can control. For, let's take email for an example, right? So I was uh, running email campaigns and um, I was like, wow, you know, the open rates are really high. So he, I, you know, I look at the open rates and the click through rates are even as high, as high, if not high. And I'm like, wow, I'm amazing. I'm a great marketer. Look at this. My messaging is on point. All these people opened it, but how could that be? I'm not that I'm not a great marketer, but how could it be that all these people opened it? Uh, you know, is that message really that compelling? So I, I just like, you know, you tend to have a little self doubt, right? And so I looked into it and what I realized is that many companies have instituted, um, you know, systems, IT systems, email system that intercept the emails. They open the email to make sure there's no malicious wear in there. They click the, the bot clicks on all the links, right? And then, uh, if not, if everything checks out, then they send it forward to the, uh, to the recipient. Uh, so I was started noticing that certain companies that all the people in that company, you know, read the email, open the email. I'm like, that's no way, no way is that happening. So sometimes you have to be just a little, you know, a little bit, uh, looking at it with a cynical edge, which, you know, scientists, that's what we're trained to do is look at things a little bit cynically and not just take everything for granted. And you have to be a little thoughtful about what you're doing, but anyway, so now, you know, of course, now we're all down, but what can we do? What could we do to make sure that um, 
we are getting the message through. I mean, maybe an email with stronger, um, you know, call to actions, you know, instead of just clicks in measuring clicks, we're measuring downloads. You know what I mean? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all I'm getting at. I like the idea there of looking at your results with a really cold calculating eye and asking yourself tough questions about them. That's sort of the analysis discussion part of the scientific process, right? The analysis and conclusions where maybe there are factors that you hadn't considered that are influencing your results. But if you have that thought process and then you analyze your data accordingly, you'll learn stuff. The great thing about experiments is you have a a hypothesis and you test it. And sometimes the hypothesis is correct and sometimes it's not. But sometimes it's even better when it's not, right? Because it forces you to go look at what the other factors might be. And then you can actually often learn a lot more from a failed, in inverted commas, failed experiment than a successful one. Because when it didn't work as you expected, you have to go deeper and try and figure it out. Right. Well, and that, that's actually a very excellent point in general. I mean, as scientists, we always promote the successes, right? And the successful experiment, the new discovery, da, 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 da. People rarely show the failures. You know, it's like, we tried it. We tried this and it didn't work, you know? Hey, you know, there, there's a thing in America is called Preparation H, um, which is used for a certain condition. And um, the reason it has, the, you, you know, the letter H is because they went through A from A to G and H was the successful one, right? That was the Preparation H. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so but they never talk about the other ones. <laughs> um, but it, likewise, when, you know, we're not talking or we're not heralding the failures and not that you want to herald them in a big way, like, well, we failed, but it's sometimes important to note to upper management, look, we're, you know, we are trying, right. We're being thoughtful about it. Things that work, we're doing more of things that don't work. We, we don't do, but we don't know until we do sometimes, right. There's something to be said for experience, but every situation is different. You know, as a consultant, I work with a lot of different uh, types of companies and you cannot apply a broad brush or just a certain framework to everybody because every company's needs are different. I mean, at the end of the day, they all want sales, obviously, but the way they go about them, the, the structure of the company, the budgets they have to work with, so on and so forth, they're all a little bit different. The competitive nature of their market is different. Um, so you, you know, you gotta be really, uh, you know, thoughtful in how you approach these, these different issues. And you have to be a little bit scientific about it. Yeah. I love that because I completely agree that experience does go a long way, but everything has its novelty. And even if you've, you might, you, as a consultant, you might work with a CRO and you run a certain tactical plan to help them achieve whatever marketing goal they're after. And it makes sense that certain aspects of that plan might, might work for another CRO that you work with in six months time, but the world would have changed. They'll have a different set of competitors and all that other stuff that you mentioned. So you can't know for sure. So there's always an element of experiment to it. Yes, you're managing risk because you're bringing experience to bear, right? So you're, you're reducing the risk that, that a certain approach won't work, but you're not eliminating it, are you? Because there's too many factors involved. Right. And, and I, I think if we were to go to anybody, any marketer and say, you know, what percentage of your uh, endeavors or initiatives are, you know, knockout of the park, right? Type of uh, initiative. I'm, you know, if they were being honest (laughs) with themselves, you know, maybe 50%, maybe 40%, but you hope that those wins far exceed the, you know, the, the losses or the failures, so to speak. I mean, in, is anything really a failure when you learn? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think on that tack, you've talked a lot about the, you know, some of the experiments that you've run and some of the work that you've done, and you've been doing this for quite a while now. So what would you, what would be like your single best marketing tip that you would pass on to other life science marketers? Uh, I think it's the same advice that my my first boss ever gave me is get the data, get the data, you know, make sure the data is solid because in science, you know, with scientists, 
will always criticize or not criticize, critique each other's experiments, right? Um, and they're looking at it with a hard eye. And the whole point of experimentation is that it needs to be independently verified, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But um, so when you go in with your data, make sure your data is good, it's clean, and be ready to, to defend it. Because uh, I think the biggest, you know, we were talking about challenges earlier. Um, and one of the biggest challenges in marketing is getting buy-in from the uh, upper management, right? Mm-hmm. And making sure that they understand because you're a cost center, you're costing them money. Are you making them any money? No, that's sales' job, right? So <laughs> is really un- is showing them the value for the money that they're uh, investing in it and that they need to continuously invest, right? It's not just like, oh, it's, you know, marketing, eh, we'll just cut marketing. We can't do that. We got to keep, we got to keep investing in it and it will show dividends. That's been proven time and again. So how do we make that argument? Because I bet that happens in a lot of organizations to a lot of marketers, especially at a time like now, right? An economic downturn. How have you had success in the past making a compelling argument to upper management when it comes to marketing? Well, I mean, it, it's it, their own data shows us, right? In the years where uh, they didn't do much, not much happened, right? It was like, it, it's not a big um, mystery because, I mean, we know, and here's the other thing is timing, right? Because most companies run on a calendar year, right? A calendar fiscal year. And, uh, but when did they start their marketing for the year? They started in January, if they're lucky. February, March, they don't even get started until April, honestly, right? And that's usually because the first conferences of the year are there and they're forced to because that's, you know, um, anchored in time. So they don't really get going until you're one quarter in, right? When really you need to be starting in October for the next year, right? And what happens is people often will miss their first quarter targets. You know, unless they're in a, some kind of bang up, um, you know, bang up technology or something, they're going to miss their first quarter and they spend the rest of the year catching up. So just let marketing do its job, but really put the emphasis on the latter part of the year. You know, um, if you, even if it is to hold budgets back um, and not let people spend everything at the beginning of the year, um, is say, look, we're going to hold this off and you're going to be able to spend 50% of your budget in the last two, uh, you know, last quarter to kind of prime the engine for the next year. I think that's the way to go. Mm, makes a lot of sense. Um, and the last question, uh, if you could go back in time, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, what piece of professional advice would you give to yourself, Jaleel? Network, network, network. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> earlier I said one of the most sustainable joys the human being could ever endure is uh, is biomedical research. Um, as an extrovert, former introvert, I think you know networking really helps a, a lot. Not only in being able to communicate with people in general, but just getting out there and meeting interesting people. Um, you know, getting to know them, because frankly, if you stay in this industry any amount of time, you're going to see these people again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So it's always nice to, you know, um, to have friends and colleagues and, you know, so on and so forth. So I would just say network. I see a lot of people are very shy and, you know, they kind of stick to their booth or stick with their colleagues and, uh, you know, uh, never really engage the other booths at a conference or things like that. I think that's a big mistake. I think you really have to get out there and get to know people. I agree. I mean, I think technical knowledge is obviously so valuable, but like when you, when I hear, listen to you talk about networking, it makes me think of that old adage. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? And ultimately humans work with humans and having connections and relationships with other humans is what actually opens the doors that might allow you to demonstrate your passion or your technical knowledge. But if you're not building those relationships at the beginning to seed that, well, you're going to have limited opportunities to really 
show what you can do and, and thrive. And having seen you on the uh, on the conference show floor, Jaleel, I know that you uh, put your money where your mouth is when it comes to um, suggestions around committing to doing great networking, because I've seen you do it in real time. Thanks. <laughs> well, that's how we met. So there you go. That is how we met. Yeah. In a bar in with a cocktail, if I remember rightly. That's right. Right. And here we are today. And here we are on the Zooms. Um, speaking from across across the pond. But um, look, thanks so much for being with me today, Jalil. Loads of zingers in there um, that I know that, that the listeners will really appreciate. If anybody's heard anything particularly interesting and they want to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Um, yeah, LinkedIn's always a great way. Um, you know, Jalil Shujat on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only one still. Um, Definitely, or they can contact me at my email, Jaleel, J A L E E L, at we speak bio.com. Absolutely amazing. Thanks again, Jaleel. I look forward to seeing you in person soon and perhaps yet another event for you this year. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I, well, you know, there's the event coming up in December, I think, the AI in marketing event. Um, so maybe I'll see you there. I'm hoping to be there. I look forward to seeing you. Cheers, right. Jaleel. Bye bye. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Life Science and Marketing Podcast. For your regular dose of cutting-edge life science marketing insights, don't forget to subscribe. Join us again in two weeks for another engaging expert discussion.